Hello and welcome to the National Museum of the Pacific Wars webinar series. My name is Jacqueline Mertz and I'm the Museum Programs Coordinator here today. Today's panel of artists is going to be moderated by Lynn Izzell, Curator Emeritus of the U.S. Marine Corps. Lynn came out of retirement just to put together the traveling exhibit, Honor, Courage, Commitment, Marine Corps Art 1975 to 2018, which our museum is actually currently hosting. Prior to being the director of the National Museum of the Marine Corps, Lynn was executive officer at the National Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian. Thank you, Lynn, for being here with us today. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, the National Museum of the Marine Corps and the Marine Corps Heritage Foundation couldn't be happier having you host our first ever traveling art exhibition. So thank you for that opportunity. We feel very welcome in, uh, in uh, Central Texas. Uh, we have three artists to talk with today, and all three of them have works that are featured in uh, the exhibition. Uh, so let me introduce all three to you. First up is Chris Battles. I think Chris is joining us from the National Museum of the Marine Corps today where he has his studio. Hi, Chris. Hello, Lynn. Thank you for having me. Great. Uh, Chris um, uh, is an artist uh, with so many specialties, uh, landscape, portrait, uh, plein air, and, and more. He enlisted in the Marine Corps Reserve in 1986 and served for 10 years. Uh, he got his BFA from Northeast Missouri State University in 91. The Marine Corps recalled him to duty to serve as a combat artist in 2006. Sergeant Battles deployed twice to Iraq and other locations. Um, and one of his assignments was also to Haiti to witness the humanitarian assistance provided by uh, the Marine Corps uh, to the survivors of the 2010 earthquake. Uh, Staff Sergeant Battles left the Marine Corps for a second time in 2014 and uh, became a civilian artist for the Navy. Uh, and now I'm quite happy to say that he's uh, back with the Marine Corps as the artist in residence for the museum. We look forward to talking with you, Chris. Alex Dewar is number two. And Alex got his BFA from Florida State University in 1983. Uh, let's see, Alex. Uh, and uh, shortly thereafter, he joined the Marine Corps. Uh, he commissioned as a second lieutenant, uh, went to flight school, uh, and as a naval aviator, flew F-4s and F-18s. Uh, Major Dewar volunteered as an artist for most of his Marine Corps career and in 2006 was accepted into the Marine Corps Combat Art Program and deployed to Iraq. He retired in 2011 as a Lieutenant Colonel and now lives in Fort Worth, Texas and flies for American Airlines. Thank you for, you for being here with us today, Alex. Thanks for having me, I'm glad to be here. Okay, Charlie Grow is number three. Um, he enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1982. And if we could have Charlie's picture up, please. Uh, he served as a combat cameraman uh, and largely was a self-taught artist. He came to the attention of the Marine Corps Combat Art Program in the mid 1980s and documented Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Somalia and other locations. Captain Grow retired from the Marine Corps in 2003 and uh, became the curator of art for the Marine Corps Museum. And I brought him on board as my deputy at the National Museum of the Marine Corps. I'm very blessed that uh, he was with me for so many years. Uh, he has since retired uh, and is living in East Tennessee uh, and still creating, still painting. Uh, thanks, Charlie, for being here. Uh, let's have the slide that shows the National Museum of the Marine Corps, please. Uh, the National Museum of the Marine Corps uh, is located right on I-95. That's the highway you see in the background and adjacent to uh, Marine Corps Base Quantico in Northern Virginia. Uh, we're on 135 acres. 
Uh, and we've got plenty of room to grow, but at 237,000 square feet, we're a pretty large museum. Uh, we exist uh, as a lasting tribute to US Marines, past, present, and future. Uh, and uh, I think you'll agree that the design of our museum is our own best billboard, uh, as you can see us so clearly from uh, the highway. Uh, the innovative technology that we use in the exhibitions surrounds the visitors with the real sights and sounds of, of Marines in action. We like to say that visitors can put their, their shoes in the boot prints of Marines uh, in every climb and place. So that's what we're all about. Uh, among the, the many collections we have uh, is art. And uh, the, the uh, Marine Corps Heritage Foundation, uh, which is our partner, uh, has helped us put art on the road. Uh, the, um, the Marine Corps Heritage Foundation's mission uh, is to preserve and promulgate the traditions, culture, and heritage of, of the Marine Corps. And one of the ways they have done that is to build uh, the National Museum of the Marine Corps. And they have contributed uh, so much to help us with the art collection over the years. Uh, there are about 9,000 pieces of art by about 100 and 350 artists. And like so many museums, most of our collection is in storage. Uh, so uh, why not put some of it on the road? And that's what this exhibition that is at the National Museum of the Pacific War is all about. So how does a museum use its, its art? Uh, in exhibits is the easy way to do it, both, both uh, reproductions and original art. And uh, we have a, an art gallery, uh, which opened in 2017. Next slide, please. Uh, the art gallery allows us to have uh, focused shows. Uh, and the one that you're looking at right here uh, is actually what spawned the traveling exhibit that you can come see uh, in Fredericksburg, Texas. Uh, we have about a third of the show that you're looking at right now uh, uh, that's going to travel to six different venues over the next couple of years. Uh, we also have a studio, and that's where Chris is joining us today. If we could look at that next slide, we'll see that this is another way museums um, use art. I mean, they can create that art in front of the visitors. And I'm not sure how Chris feels about having people watch him uh, at work, but it was part of uh, how we wanted to share what goes on behind the scenes with visitors every day. Uh, we also loan our artwork to others, uh, and uh, this is a, a program that we hope to expand. Uh, the show that's come to Fredericksburg was packed very, very carefully, as you might expect. Uh, customized crates uh, with uh, ethafoam trays uh, protect the, the uh, 36 works by 15 artists as they travel uh, around the country, uh, including two sculptures. And the next slide shows a small bust and how it's uh, protected as it travels from, from place to place. So uh, we are proud of what we're doing. Uh, we've screened our six venues very carefully to make sure that uh, they will uh, protect and share uh, this precious art with as many people as possible. So if you haven't seen the show, uh, we hope you'll, you'll do that. Uh, okay, our first artist is going to be uh, Chris Battles. Uh, we've got a series of questions for Chris. Chris? Uh, yes, Tell us about the history of the Marine Corps art program. Uh, I understand it's got its roots in World War II, and that's going to be of interest to the people who are listening today. That's true. Well, our collection goes back into the 1800s, but the combat art program as we know it today does have its origins in World War II. Um, we, we counted in 1942 really as the, the uh, birth date of our program. 
But General Robert Denick and the Division of Public Relations was really the germ for all of this. It was started in July of 1941, even before the war came around. And so he was called out of retirement uh, a day after he retired, as a matter of fact. Uh, and on July 1st, 1941, they established the Division of Public Relations. And so they began recruiting combat correspondents, combat artists, and combat photographers. So all of these current um, MOSs and fields uh, have their roots in the same organization. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a couple of uh, World War II related works of art uh, 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 ready to look at. Could we have the first one, please? Now, I don't know if you would categorize this as, as combat art. Uh, what are we looking at and, and how would you characterize this piece? Well, in the, in the profession of combat art, we, we, are, we do divide a little bit the difference between what we call combat illustration and combat art. Both are very valid, for, valid forms of expression uh, in military art. Uh, and this one in particular is being a combination of two very famous photographs of the flag raisings at Siribachi in Iwo Jima in 1945. So the artist has taken reference material from two different photographs uh, and then sort of compressed time and space to show this event uh, in, a, in a new way. And so it does illustrate very faithfully the event, uh, but it doesn't do it from that artist's particular experience. This artist wasn't present at the time of it, but use those photographs from the person that was present to create this illustration. So combat art differs slightly in, in the fact that it's done by the artist, the combat artist, or the war artist in the field and who is experiencing the very things that he or she depicts later on. I can imagine that illustrators must get a lot of inspiration from the sketches captured by the combat artists in the field. Well, let's, uh, look at the, let's look at the next slide. All right, this also is a combat illustration. This is done by one of my favorite artists in the collection. Uh, there are so many great artists in the collection, but this is Tom Lovell. He was a sergeant in World War II, he was one of the um, people recruited from the professional world. He was a professional illustrator at the time, very talented, skilled, and experienced. And so Leatherneck Magazine sort of took him aside and said, hey, you're gonna paint for us. And so he did a series of wonderful combat illustrations about uh, battles in the war. And uh, so we have them in, in the collection today. This is of Tarawa, which uh, was Basio Island uh, in the Gilbert Islands uh, in November of uh, 1943. So these illustrations and the combat art helps, helped keep the Americans at home aware of what was going on in their Marine Corps. Yes, ma'am. General Denning thought it was very important. And of course, we still believe this today that people in, in the States know what their Marines are doing. And so, you know, and he, General Denig said that this is, a, the people, this is a people's war and the people have a right to know what's going on. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about your career, Chris. I understand you always planned to be an artist. How did your service in the Marine Corps influence that? Well, I had, from a young age, I was drawing, uh, whether it's military, some of my earliest works are actually, uh, illustrations, so to speak, of revolutionary war scenes and that sort of thing. So I'd always loved history and I always loved drawing and sculpting out of clay. And so I did that my whole childhood. And so I never knew how those two different loves would come together until I was a Marine reservist and I would see these wonderful uh, illustrations by Charlie Gro Charlie Gro Charlie Waterhouse, Colonel Waterhouse. I saw some good Charlie Groves too, by the way, we'll talk about those. But um, I saw these, these illustrations everywhere I went and I was just inspired by these things as a young Marine. And I thought, what a great thing this is, this, these beautiful illustrations that, that told of the Marine Corps history in such a wonderful way. So years later, I'm talking to online this artist overseas, uh, Chief Warrant Officer Michael Fay, who recruited me. And so he had me talk to Charlie Grove, who was the curator at the time, and then Colonel Camp, who was the officer in charge of the history division on Quantico and they interviewed me and then they asked if I would consider re-enlisting, which I did 20 years, one day and one, one, 20 years, one month and one day after I originally enlisted. I was almost immediately called to active duty and then within a month and a half, I was in Iraq on my first art deployment. Great story, great story. One of the things you're known for uh, is your portrait work and you have two portraits in the traveling exhibition that's in Fredericksburg now. 
Uh, tell us about uh, about this one. All right, this is a portrait I did of uh, one of the Osprey aviators. This is Captain Okuriba. She was uh, one of the first female uh, Osprey aviators. Uh, and this, this uh, deployment in 2007, which was also my second deployment to Iraq, this was the first, it was a historic deployment of the Osprey, which is the MV-22 uh, aircraft, which can take off vertically and then fly as an aircraft. So it's kind of a hybrid, they say, between the, a helicopter and a, and a fixed wing aircraft. But she was, uh, in this scene, she's uh, suited up in her, in her body armor and her helmet because they were having a, a security drill to, to protect the perimeter. And so she's protecting the squadron area there. I see, I see. Um, I, I really like both of the portraits that are in this traveling show. I think folks will really like seeing them. Um, you've worked as a civilian artist now for both the Navy and, uh, and the Marine Corps. How do the two services approach uh, art differently, or is it pretty much the same? Well, we share a very common philosophy. As you know, the Marine Corps is a department of the Navy, although we may not always talk about that. But we are a, obviously a sister service, and we uh, share almost all of our culture uh, and our combat art culture as well. So our... our um, philosophies, the Navy and the Marine Corps, is to send artists to document as faithfully as they can through sketches and then later through fine art what the sailors or Marines are doing. And so of course, many times as a combat artist for the Marine Corps, I was sketching corpsmen, which are Navy medical personnel. And then during my time as a civilian for the Navy, I was sketching sometimes Marines involved in the amphibious operations and that sort of thing. So they cross, they share, they cross pollinate and they, they share the same values. Right. Great. Um, let's look at that great big painting that uh, we saw briefly here a second ago. Um, uh, your painting uh, as a Navy artist, but you happen to be in the Marine Corps studio at the time, another piece of that cross-pollination. Uh, so what are we looking at? Is this the biggest thing you've ever done? This is the biggest easel painting I have ever done. And it takes two easels, or at least it took at the time, two easels to do um, until we got our nice, beautiful Hughes easel there. We have in, two of them in the studio. Anyway, we, this is 10 feet by six feet. So it is the biggest thing I've ever had to work on. And actually Charlie Grow helped me build this. We, we brought in the wood stretcher bars and we rolled out the canvas and, and he was stretching up on one side with his pliers and his staple gun and I was doing it on the other side. And so we, we, we built this big thing we had to measure the elevator to make sure it would also uh, be able to come out of the museum. Uh, I, I can't wait to see it. I understand it might, it might go on display at the Pentagon. It's true. We, we hope they say that there's a place that they've talked about putting it in, in the Pentagon. It's currently being framed. It's at the Navy uh, collection. And so hopefully you'll see it if you visit the Pentagon soon. Good, good. I look forward to that. One last question, Chris. Um, as the artist in residence, uh, what do you think is your most important role to ensure that the program is long lived and vibrant? Well, I have two major roles. One of them is to produce um, artwork and historical illustrations for the Marine Corps. But I think in, in, as far as this question is concerned, the more important role for the longevity of the program is the recruitment and the training role. So I, my job is to oversee the, the uh, combat artists as well. So I recruit and I train and I mentor and of course, I also learn a lot from some of our artists. We have some of the, we have some world class artists that we work with, and so recruitment is very important in training and training and sending. I also send artists when when I can to various um, contingencies overseas and in the United States. Uh, it's so important to have you with us. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chris, for being the artist in residence and for sharing your thoughts this afternoon. Okay, we're going to go to Fort Worth, Texas now, and talk to Alex Durr. Um, Alex, you began your training as an artist and as a Marine uh, almost simultaneously. How did that work out for you? Well, uh, I was an art major at school, and then uh, I, I figured to uh, use college to develop a, a, a talent and then uh, uh, use the military for a vocation. So it was, it was, it was at wh while I was at flight school, I visited the uh, National Museum of Naval Aviation in Pensacola, and uh, I discovered that there was combat artists and aviation artists. And it, it, it was 
something I, I knew nothing about. And I, I just started uh, gathering information and, and almost parallel my aviation career, certain uh, publications would have articles every now and then on the combat art program. And, uh, and, and every Marine sees a Charlie Waterhouse uh, picture uh, and, 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 wing, and in other naval aviation publications like Wings of Gold, they have an article on R.G. Smith, who is uh, also an aviation artist and a combat artist, as well as a civilian engineer. But it was it was just it just seemed to parallel as I went through. And then I was stationed in uh, Andrews uh, outside of D.C. And I was able to go over and meet uh, some of the artists in the program at the Navy Yard when they used to be up in D.C. Let's have that next slide. Uh, and we're looking at, at Alex um, as, a, as a marine aviator uh, and, and doing some art. But that's, that's it. Um, an aviation artist is kind of how you've been labeled. Uh, is that how you think of yourself or do you take a more uh, general approach to art? Well, I, I like to do all sorts of different kind of artwork, but I have seemed to make a uh, made a career as an aviation artist. It's very specialized. And, and the unique thing about airplanes, and I know this is a bold statement, but they're almost just as difficult as, as painting people. If you don't get it just right, uh, the pilots and the mechanics, the ground crew that work on them will, will tell immediately uh, that there's something wrong with it. So you have, you have to pay a lot of attention uh, to mm -hmm. that. So it, it's helpful that you uh, trained with uh, the ground crew, the air crew, you know what's going on with uh, the aircraft. So you know what to look for. Um, how do you go about the research? How do you go about getting it all right? That's an interesting, uh, it, <coughs> you almost have to be a, a, a uh, I love history and there's a lot of history. I, I have done a lot of uh, historical events where I've uh, talked to the pilots that were involved. And in one case, I, I wasn't able to talk to the pilot, but I, I knew the aircraft, there was photographs. I got the, the, the numbers right. He uh, was bombing a Japanese ship off the Philippines. And I, I, uh, I, I did that as an illustration for a military history quarterly years ago. And after his publication, I got a phone call from the pilot and I thought I was gonna get a list of all the things I got wrong, but he loved it. We ended up making prints of it. And uh, it, it, it's really special because he, he lived in Tennessee, but he would spend a lot of time in Pensacola. And he was a docet, a volunteer uh, at the Naval Aviation Museum. I ended up donating the painting to the uh, museum later. But that, that was, a, yeah, as, as opposed to one of my other not so colorful, uh, uh, not so proud moments. I, I got actually the tail rotor of a helicopter wrong once, and it made the cover of uh, Leatherneck, and, and a lot of people wrote in about that. So. Oh, you heard about that. <laughs> oh, yes, I did. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Let's look at the next slide, uh, which is Viper Inbound. And this is the work that's in the Traveling Art Show. Tell us about it. So this, this scene is, uh, De depict something I witnessed, I was a part of. Um, it, it's, the scene shows the armed escort for a, a Kazabak. The Kazabak is a CH-46 in the background. And uh, every Kazabak has an armed escort. This was uh, in Iraq in 2006, going into the, uh, the big air base uh, that had the largest hospital in country in Balad, about 30 miles north of Iraq. And it just, as these helicopters go on the final approach into the ramp at the at the uh, at the hospital area, there was a mosque they would fly by, and I just thought that the symbolism was pretty uh, unique to that that scene in Iraq. It is. It is. Well, what kind of tools of the trade do you take with you when when you do deploy? Well, uh, a, a little sketch pad, a journal, uh, a, a camera, a little digital camera, battery powered obviously, and uh, I would take watercolors. It, it was hard, in order to do oils, you have to set up and, and do some, you know, I'm not saying you can't do it, but it's, it's a lot more stuff to bring. It, that's in addition, I also traveled with an easel, a little French box that collapsed and, and uh, I could carry in a backpack. But uh, that gear, in addition to all the required uh, protective personal equipment, we had to have the flak jacket, the helmet, the big backpack, uh, I don't think I brought the e-tool, but 
everything else uh, that we would take as well as weapons. It, it ended up being the, the big giant backpack and, and two full uh, parachute bags worth of equipment. Good, good. Well, we, we, uh, we all appreciate what you were able to capture when you were deployed. Um, Alex, you mentioned water collars, and I know you work with oil and water collar. Um, here's a particular painting you brought with you to the reception at uh, the Pacific War Museum. Uh, and I've seen, uh, I've seen this same work in both watercolor and in oil. Uh, tell us about the differences. Why, why did you go and redo this painting? So the original I was able to do in country, uh, I, I did two of them actually. One, and, and don't tell Charlie Grow this, but at one I gave to, uh, at the time she was a Staff Sergeant uh, Watson, who in her own right is a world-class rifleman. And uh, she, at that time, she was attached to the civil affairs group and um, she wanted something to send back to her daughter. So back inside the battle box, I had her put on all of her gear and, and I did a quick uh, watercolor. I also took photographs, but she had this predict, particular smirk that I wanted to capture. And in order to do the, the image justice, I ended up doing an oil painting back in the studio when I came back uh, from Iraq. And, um, and and that oil painting is part of the Marine Corps collection. Well, it, it's it's still here in the studio. I'm fixing ah. to send it off to uh, to Miss Joan Thomas someday. Ah, okay. <laughs> I promise. I'll follow through <laughs> <Okay>. on that. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go uh, to uh, Northeast Tennessee right now and talk to Charlie Grow. Charlie, you've been a combat photographer, a combat artist, a, a curator of Marine Corps art. Um, how do these roles differ? How are they similar? Well, let me start with how they're similar. All three of them uh, support visual storytelling. As an artist, you're, you're responsible for seeing, experiencing, and interpreting things that you see. And you're held accountable to that, that level of, uh, of interpretation. It has to be authentic. As a photographer, you have to be there on the moment to take the picture or you're not going to get it. And as a curator, you have to put together a collection that tells the whole story, the whole visual story. And in our case, that story is of the Marine Corps. So the air, the ground, the combat service support, the, all the pieces of the, of the pie get told in that story. How they're different is, uh, is another question. They... Uh, Photographers have to be there to capture the image. But uh, if it's too dark, if it's too rainy, if, it's, uh, if you miss the moment by a fraction of a second, you don't get the photograph. An artist, on, on the other hand, can experience something, can see something, and draw it or paint it after the fact. If it's too dark, you can uh, adjust the lighting and paint something that's a night scene. It's, um, I think that there are, that the, they're two pages in the same book and they're both equally necessary to tell the whole visual story. And, and what about art curation? What, what does that even mean? So to curate the art collection is to make sure that you've got pictures that tell the story of the Marine Corps, every facet of the Marine Corps. And you, you don't tell the artist what to paint per se, but you make suggestions for gaps in the collection. And they might uh, be inspired by one of those uh, suggestions and go out and capture pictures of, of uh, chaplains or uh, uh, engineers or military policemen. And you put those pictures together. And in a, in a way, you're telling the master story, visual story of the Marine Corps from a very broad perspective. Um, you're weaving together this tapestry of works by all these different artists who uh, can be pilots or infantrymen or cooks or communicators or engineers. And their unique little perspective of, uh, of the Marine Corps gets woven into this tapestry that we call the collection. And it, and it tells a very broad and deep story about the Marine Corps. And, and then we hope too that the curator can develop shows and share, share that work with a, a broad public like we're doing with the traveling show. Very much so, absolutely. 
Um, of those three roles you just talked about, uh, what one did you enjoy most and why? Well, it's a close uh, race, but I think I like being an artist best. I love creating. It's uh, what scratches my creative itch. It's, uh, it's what I've always wanted to do since I was a little boy. Um, it allows me to uh, explore things and tell stories that impact people in a way that has made them laugh and made them cry. And I, I found that to be harder to do with photography. And um, yeah, being an artist, that, yeah. that's my number and one. Your, your answer uh, does not surprise me. Uh, when you were a, the deputy director, uh, you also were assigned always to do a, a work or two a year to keep that creativity going. Thank you for doing that over the years. Uh, which Marine Corps artists have had the most influence on your own work? So I think that the, there's three of them. Colonel Peter Michael Gish, he's a plein air artist. He's a watercolorist. He paints a la prima, which means uh, one stroke and he's done. Um, and he, uh, he was a close friend and mentor, always telling me to, uh, to focus on contrasts and telling a story. Um, Jack Dyer would be a second one. And his guidance to me was to be simple, bold, and true. Uh, in other words, simplify what you're portraying to the, the basis element possible, to the simplest element possible, and uh, it'll have a stronger impact. Be bold with your statements and be true to what you see, the good, the bad, or the ugly. Um, and lastly, I would say is Charlie Waterhouse. Charlie Waterhouse was a, a longtime dear friend. He was a, uh, an artist's soul and a warrior's body. He was a, a World War II veteran. And uh, he critiqued my work over the years and, uh, and told me more stuff about telling stories and interpreting things so, so that a broad audience would understand what I'm trying to show. Let's go to the, the slide we have of a Charlie Waterhouse piece. Talk a little bit about the breadth of his, of his work, Charlie. Wow, we, we could do an entire show on Charlie Waterhouse. Oh, we could. And just get started good. He's, uh, he, he was an enlisted Marine. He joined the, the uh, Marine Corps in 1943, and he was wounded on Iwo Jima. Um, during the fifth day of the battle. So he brings all of that experience with him. And over the years, he donated, uh, well, he did 500 works plus for the collection that, uh, that go from uh, pencil drawings and ink drawings all the way up to full acrylic paintings. And in addition to that, he put together a couple hundred uh, uh, very nice uh, historical illustrations of Marines and Navy uh, uh, corpsmen earning the Medal of Honor and about 105 portraits of Marines and, and Navy corpsmen er that earned the Medal of Honor. It's, it's a very broad collection that he put together. And during Vietnam, he served three tours uh, as, uh, as an artist with the Salma Gundy Club for the Navy in a program called NACAL. And uh, he put together uh, hundreds of pieces for that. So his, his collection is very broad and deep. He always and focused he a, on people. And he was a sculptor too. Uh, he was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, interesting story. He got uh, wounded in his left arm and that caused nerve damage. And that uh, his, his uh, way of dealing with nerve damage was to start molding clay. And that, that injury, that, that uh, combat wound from uh, Iwo Jima is what started him as, as a uh, sculptor. Amazing, amazing. Uh, so you mentioned Vietnam. Uh, we have a couple of slides uh, in the queue from, from that era. Uh, this is by Jim Butcher. And I, I know from uh, the collection that this is another rich uh, source. For, for the Marine Corps art collection. There's a lot that came from the Vietnam era. Uh, what are we seeing here? 
So what we're seeing here is a, a watercolor by a young enlisted Marine named Jim Butcher, Corporal Jim Butcher. And uh, Marines are exiting the tail ramp of a CH-53 Alpha uh, on an insert mission in Vietnam. It's uh, one of about 2,700 pieces in the collection that focus on Vietnam because the, the collection, uh, the program by and large uh, atrophied after World War II. And uh, one of Denig's original demons, uh, Ray Henry, was brought back in to help stand it back up again. So in uh, the 1960s, Colonel Ray Henry uh, was responsible for standing up the uh, combat art program again. And he did so in, a, in, a, in an amazing manner. They put together uh, dozens of artists and um, a couple thousand uh, pieces of work. Um, about how long did uh, did an artist recruited for this purpose uh, stay in country? So it varied. Uh, some stayed as few as uh, four weeks, and some stayed as long as a year. Um, Caselli and uh, Yako, for instance, both stayed for a year. Some of the enlisted artists, or uh, I'm sorry, the civilian artists, uh, only went in country for uh, three or four weeks. Um, so there was a, a pretty broad swath mm -hmm. of uh, time available for, uh, for the uh, participants. Uh, you mentioned Caselli, and we have one of his pieces up next. And my question to you, Charlie, is this doesn't look like combat to me. Uh, and I've seen many pieces in our collection that depict uh, uh, the Vietnamese people, the Somali people, street scenes, farming scenes. Uh, what does this have to do with uh, combat art? Well, it, it goes back to um, what General Denning directed. He, he said basically, go to war and do art. His direction was very broad and it allows the artists to interpret what's important to them. And it goes back to storytelling. So artists commonly portray Marines in action and Marines doing things and what they're doing. But uh, we also portray where they live, the uh, environment they're in, the people they interact with, the little children in the Vietnamese market, for instance. So here is a, a tent with a bunker uh, complex on the end of it. And this is, this is how Marines lived in uh, this part of Vietnam when uh, Henry Caselli was, was there on active duty. Um, it tells part of the story. And without this, that story is less complete. I've, I've heard you speak fondly of a couple of pieces that you created uh, of Somali children. Yeah, uh, I think that... Um, when you're, when you're telling the story, it's important to, to tell the entire story, the whole story. So um, I'll use Colonel Gish as, as an example. I think his Somali children are probably the best in the collection. Uh, we were sent to Somalia specifically to help feed the, uh, the starving Somalis. So how do you tell that story without showing people that are starving? And uh, of the people that are starving, the ones that seem to be suffering the most were the little children. It strings uh, the heartstrings, it strums the heartstrings in a way that I think is necessary to the story and important to, uh, to tell the mission of why the Marines were there in the first place. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it always comes back to what story are you trying to tell? It really does. Yeah. Um, you have several works in the traveling show, uh, and uh, this one is very personal uh, to you, and uh, I'd like you to tell us about it, please. So uh, in 2007, my uh, son-in-law was killed. He was a Marine lieutenant, and um, when uh, a service member dies, you become a Gold Star family. You see that flag in the, in the window above the little girl? That's a gold star flag. The gold star flag dates back to World War I. And so there's, uh, there's blue star flags for families of, uh, of uh, service members who are alive and gold star flags for families of service members who died. And when, uh, when my son-in-law died, um, 
it had a, a profound impact on my on my granddaughter. She would uh, she would ask about uh, where daddy was and when he was coming home. And in this scene, she's looking wistfully through the sidelight by our front door with her uh, faithful golden retriever, Harper. And um, the gold star flag above her head tells the story that she's uh, a military child, that her daddy's not coming home. And for me, it was such a, a powerful moment. And I thought that it was uh, broadly applicable. There were so many uh, service members who were killed in action during Afghanistan and Iraq that this had to have a broader application than just my family. So I, I painted it because I thought that it was um, more universal than, than just the Grove family. Yeah. And uh, the show is enriched by, by its presence. Thank you very much, Charlie. Uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, National Museum of the Pacific War for uh, hosting us. Uh, and for the Marine Corps Heritage Foundation for sponsoring the show uh, on the road. Uh, Jacqueline, I thought you might like to know where else the show is going. Uh, we, uh, we started at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson uh, early this year. Then we came to Texas. Uh, next, we're going to the St. George Art Museum in St. George, Utah. Uh, and uh, from there we go to Dayton, Ohio, to the National Museum of the Air Force, uh, then to Northern California, to Turtle Bay Exploration Park, and we close out the show in mid-23 at the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum. So um, uh, our three artists' work and, and others will be on display around the country, and we hope this is just the first of many shows that we will have. So thank you to Fredericksburg, Texas. And uh, Jacqueline, have you got any questions for the artists? Yes, so thank you again, uh, everyone, for this great conversation. I'm gonna start off with my question. So um, with the art pieces being um, viewable to the public, how is the art received by the public itself when they come and see it? Uh, Charlie, uh, why don't you take that question and then we'll get Chris's take on it too, uh, talking about um, uh, how you have seen um, Marine Corps art displayed and received by uh, different audiences around the country. Charlie? Okay, certainly. So the, uh, the Marine Corps art collection has been uh, used for uh, dozens and dozens of art exhibits around the country uh, during Vietnam, for, for instance. And it was, uh, it was displayed so that people could see what was going on. And as you can imagine, with uh, all the war protests, it was open to um, a wide range of interpretations. And so uh, the Marine Corps used the art collection, the exhibits to help reach public uh, public publics that uh, they wouldn't otherwise be able to talk to or have, uh, have uh, conversations with. Um, in 2005 or 2006, we had an exhibit at the Farnsworth Museum and it was called Fire and Ice. And it was largely uh, work done by uh, a real good artist named uh, Chief One Officer Michael Fay. And Mike is there for the opening. He shows up in his dress uniform and outside there's a, a, a group of protesters waiting on him. And so uh, undaunted, Mike goes outside and he has a conversation with these people and he invites them in and he gives them a personal tour of uh, fire and ice. And what they see is a collection of psychological portraits that tell uh, a story of young Marines doing difficult things in harm's way. And by the end of uh, his tour and his talk with them, most of the protesters had changed their tune. They could be mad, upset with the war, for instance, but not, not have to be mad with the warrior. Um, so it's, uh, it's a, a valuable tool in communicating with people, especially people with whom you might disagree. Let's go to Chris now. Uh, 
Chris, by now you've seen a lot of our visitors uh, go in and out of the uh, Combat Art Gallery. Um, how, how are they receiving our work? Well, it's been one of the wonderful parts of the, of the job that I have. I, I knew that I was going to be interacting with the public, but um, it's not necessarily a big part of the job description, but it's a wonderful uh, everyday part of it because I have people, we call this the fishbowl, by the way, and you've seen the pictures of the big windows and uh, jokingly, we, we call it the fishbowl. And I, I used to, as a young artist, hate the idea of people watching me work, but now I've gotten quite used to it. And actually, if I see people uh, staring in the window a little bit, I will, uh, of course, talk to them. And, and they, they love seeing the work. I've had people come in who have seen one of the, like the big painting you showed uh, of the, the aviation elements on the, the ship, the big 10 foot by six foot painting. I've had people who, who were in that very, on that ship. And one of them was even in the scene. Uh, remember, and I remembered him from the, the, the day I was out there um, sketching and taking photographs. So they, it, it's, it's a wonderful way to, um, build those like charlie was talking about the, the bridges between cultures and also just a spree amongst service members uh, who've been involved in, in whatever generation because even though we may change the uniform and the equipment and the aviation assets all these things though these things may change the 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 group the the type of person that serves and and the type of family that has a service member is the same it's 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 all part of the american experience across generations next question Okay, hey, so we have a great comment from actually Dave before we move on to our next one. He says, probably the best produced and presented webinar I have viewed over the years from the National Museum of the Pacific War. I was Navy, but the Marines certainly won this round. <laughs> so thank you guys again. Thank you, Dave, for that fabulous comment. Um, so our next question is coming from uh, Ruth Ann. Uh, she said that you guys mentioned civilian artists. What percentage of artists who participate in the program are civilians? And is it difficult to protect, protect them while they are in dangerous situations? Chris, why don't you take that one? So currently, actually, the majority of our artists are civilian because even a lot of our retired Marine uh, and former combat artists are now working when, they, when we send them, they are civilians. So we've only got two or three uniformed Marine artists that we utilize. The difficulty, of course, in sending a civilian is the fact that they, that they aren't armed, for example. They do have protective equipment they wear. They'll wear a helmet and the, the, uh, the body armor or the flak jacket, as we call it. Uh, and of course, they have to prove uh, to be a part of the program, you have to know, you have to, you have to be confident to um, go to a, a not so safe environment and do your work without being a danger to the Marines and sailors that, that are hosting you. And so we have to build confidence with the units that we attach artists to. And we also have to instill in, in the artist or find the artist who is comfortable enough uh, to do that sort of thing. We've been very fortunate. Some of our civilian artists are already, uh, well experienced in deploying as civilians in the past. And so we've used them uh, currently. Next question. Sure. So this person asked, how do you think the art collection and museum as well as the National Museum of the Pacific War can reach audiences who don't seem to be interested in the stories we are trying to tell? Let me take a stab at, 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 at that one uh, to start off with. One of the things I hoped that a traveling art show would do would be attract people who had an interest in art, but not necessarily an interest in, in the military or military history. Uh, so I'm hoping that everywhere we go, uh, we'll have a certain segment of our visitorship uh, really say, Wow, uh, I had no idea the services were doing this. Uh, let me find out more. Uh, and the, uh, the other way I hope people do that is to log into the websites of the, the various uh, museums uh, who are producing uh, combat art. Uh, uh, Alex, uh, would you like to comment a little bit more on that one too? The uh, well, I, I'm I'm seeing there's a question from uh, Mike Biskinas about the reaction span 
uh, from the service members when working in forward areas. I mean, not to get, it, it's sort of related to that. Uh, <laughs> it, it was the same kind of reaction that uh, the field historians would get. And also my, my friends that I knew that were working in uh, Marine Corps Lessons Learned, that you're, you're not, uh, you're, you're not going to interfere with the unit. You're going to keep up with them. You're going to be out of the way. And, uh, and you're, you're just there to tell your, their story, the Marine story. Uh, and I, I think that was one of the, one of the greatest gifts of the, of the job was to tell their story, whether it was, uh, I, I remember being uh, one of my reserve jobs, I was attached uh, in, in field artillery into the DASC, a, a big tent command area thing. And it's run and produced and stood up by professional people who know how the computers work, set up the tents and, and that's their profession. They, they, they direct the, uh, the, the direct air support in the forward area and the combined arms, whether it's artillery, air, and all the stuff that's displayed is classified. And there's a lot of downtime in the Marine Corps. And I did a sketch of this room and I le left all the computer screens blank, but those guys loved it. They made prints of it, posters, because nobody was able to really tell their story. So that, that's sort of a, a generalized way to answer that. Thank you. Jacqueline, anything else? Yes, uh, this is from uh, Barbara. She's asking, is there a plan to put together a book or a booklet of the artworks of this exhibit that people could possibly purchase? Well, right now, there's no plan for a publication, uh, but there is a website called Request a Print. And each of the images in the traveling show uh, is online uh, in a special uh, folder uh, dedicated to this traveling art show. Uh, but I love the idea. Maybe we'll try to sell that uh, as part of our next, uh, next venture. Okay, another question is, uh, how do you go about choosing what art pieces actually go on to each exhibit, um, especially the one that that's coming here? Why did you choose those pieces? Well, I, I, I'll answer it specifically, but then I'd like Charlie to talk generally about how an art show comes together. Uh, this show was a subset of the original show that we opened in 2017, dedicated to Marines who served after Vietnam. Uh, so we picked a variety of, of works that were sturdy enough to travel, uh, that weren't too big, weren't too small, uh, but showed uh, all of the themes that we wanted to, to show. So that was easy by comparison. Uh, but Charlie, how do you put together a, a show from scratch? Well, it, it, like I said, it starts with the story. You've got to tell a broad story and then you've got to plug it in with details. And those details have to, if in an ideal world, uh, strum heartstrings. So in this one, you've got a beginning, a middle and an end. Marines uh, serve in every climate and place. They uh, serve in harm's way. And uh, there's a price to be paid for that. So you divide the story into sections and then you pick uh, images that tell the, that part of the story. And from a Marine perspective, you try to make sure that you tell as much of the story as possible. So we don't just focus on infantry or aviation or combat service support. You've got to make sure that all of those are included uh, you've got to make sure that it tells a story that shows the face of the Corps. So you've got women involved and, and uh, all the different races and all the different military occupational specialties. So it's, uh, it's not an easy thing, but it sure is fun to do. <laughs> I agree with that. In fact, we had a matrix to make sure that whatever we did, whatever show, whatever exhibit we were planning, we covered all of the bases. So uh, we tried to do that with this show too, Jacqueline. Awesome. Uh, well, I think that's all the questions that we have. So I want to thank you all again for uh, coming on and talking about uh, your history with the program and about the art pieces that you've done um, and talking about like, the, yeah, the Marine Corps art program. We really appreciate it. The exhibit um, will actually be on display here at the National Museum of the Pacific War until January of 2022. So we hope that you'll be able to stop by and check us out and check out the exhibit before it goes on to its next location. 
Thank you to everyone for your ongoing support of the museum and our programs. And we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Jacqueline. I just want to put in one final pitch. Uh, if you'd like to know more uh, about the National Museum of the Marine Corps, our website is usmcmuseum.com. If you'd like to know more about the Marine Corps Heritage Foundation, it's marineheritage.org. And thanks again to the Marine Corps Heritage Foundation for making all of this possible. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye now.